We're glad to have Brother Rick Martin with us. He has, uh, went to the Philippines in 1977 with his wife Becky after surrendering in 1976 in a pastor school here to go to that country. And God has used him tremendously with really literally hundreds and hundreds of churches started multitude thousands and maybe even millions of people have heard the gospel as a result of one man who said to his wife we're going to the Philippines and God has used him in a wonderful way we've been graced with his presence all week we're looking forward to this Sunday school lesson today let's listen carefully with our hearts open our Bibles ready to see what God has to say to us this morning God bless you brother Martin you come would you thank you brother Wilkerson and good morning to everybody Thank you for being here today. I want to thank you for the many things you've done for me this week. Uh, so many things, except that video a few minutes ago. <laughs> I was out there just messing around, but you're right. You got to be careful who you, uh, you know, who, wh what you say, and then also who you affiliate yourself with, who you hang around. You know, Brother Wilkerson was an innocent pastor years ago, and I had a joker, and uh, it was a lot of fun to be with. And uh, I have enjoyed being with you, and uh, I want to thank Brother Vargo for putting up with me. Uh, at his home for several days. I've enjoyed it so much. Uh, he uh, knows a lot about the history of this church and so grateful to him and grateful for Brother John Francis. Took me to Chicago yesterday and got to see my old bus route. It was on 40 years ago and uh, we have two of our members, Mark and Ethel Verdad, who, are, uh, who have been here in your church for several years. They live on my old bus route, that same area, the exact same place and got to see them yesterday. And uh, I just thank God for all the things that you've done for us. Um, I've been eating some good food this week. I mean, I love Filipino food, but this has been a lot of fun coming back to the U.S. and eating. In the Philippines, you eat rice all the time. You eat rice for breakfast, you eat rice for lunch, you eat rice for supper. And when I first went on my survey trip, I started eating the rice and it was pretty good. But after a while, you want something different. And one day, this lady this, in her home brought out uh, something different. It was it looked like a, a, a boiled egg. And what it really was was a balut. I don't know if any of you know what a balut is. How many of you know what a blue is? You know what, Brother Wilkerson? We'll be sharing one of those with you in September after that video. A blue is a, blue is a duck egg, and about three or four days before it hatches, they, they take the duck and they, they, they eat it. And uh, it's the embryo and everything inside there, and I didn't know what it was. And so the uh, lady, I got ready to crack that boiled egg and, you know, take the shell off. And she said, wait, wait, Joe. They call you Joe in the Philippines if you're an American because of the G.I. Joes in World War II. They don't know your name. Said, hey, Joe. Hey, Joe. Hey, Joe. Wait, wait. I said, what? She said, you crack a hole in the top. I said, really? Well, you know, I thought that was a customer or something. So I cracked a hole in the top of that. And I said, okay, now what do I do? And she said, well, you, you, uh, you, you suck the juice out. I said, what juice? She said, the duck juice. I said, oh, this is a duck, not a chicken. I got to thinking, well, you know, maybe it tastes like chicken noodle soup or something. And uh, I got that duck and I said, okay. So I cracked the hole in the top of it and, and then I turned it upside down and I started sucking that juice. Oh, I, you know what, that slimy stuff. And what it was is the guts of that duck all boiled up inside there. And, oh, I was getting sick. And, and But you got to be diplomatic when you're a missionary and you go over to places. And I said, oh, it's really good and delicious. And then I took the shell off and there's that embryo of that duck and the stuff all over it. And so I uh, started eating that stuff around the duck and I got done with that. And, and then finally I just put the, the duck on the table and, and uh, she looked at me and she said, Joe, you got to eat the duck too. I said, you eat the duck? She said, that's the best part. I said, oh really? I said, well, I'm really full. Uh, I, I've, I've already eaten lunch and this is kind of like dessert, you know? And uh, she said, oh Joe, you're, you're so skinny. Man, if you eat, Blue, the, the duck, you'll get big and strong like us. I said, look, lady, I will, I will, uh, I will uh, lift weights. I will eat more. And uh, she, so I finally took a bite of that duck. He's just looking up at me like that, you know? So I picked him up and took a bite, and then I lost all my diplomacy. And uh, no more ducks. But uh, we're going to give one to Brother Wilkerson when he comes over after that video. You might get more than just the duck. I got better stuff than that. I got lots of tricks up my sleeve. I'm, I've been hanging around the wrong people for a long time, like Kevin Wynn, so. You know, years ago, well, years ago, I was, uh, when I was ordained here at this church many years ago in the old auditorium, the night I was ordained, I, I, Brother Howells took me back to his office after the service, and we talked for a little while, and that was really a wonderful experience just to spend a few moments with him. And I asked him the question, I said, you know, you know, what do you think about having a furlough someday? What's your opinion about that? And, 
And um, he said, well, he said, I'm not a missionary. I don't know. I said, but I would, it'd be hard for me to leave the field for very long, even maybe a month. It'd be really hard for me, but I'm not a missionary, so I can't really say. But now he said, you know what? When you, if you do ever come back, he said, make sure that you, he said the mistake a lot of missionaries make, he said, was that they, they, they don't talk about the, the, the mission field and people want to know what's going on. And so today I want to give you a lesson from the Word of God, some principles about the blessings of generous, faithful, consistent giving. But then I want to apply it to the Philippines. I want to tell you some of the things that are going on there. And I hope it will, be, I hope it will kill two birds with one stone, you might say. I want to, I want to thank you for what you've done. And I um, also want to share what's going on there in the Philippines. You know, this church carries a heavy load. Uh, because you have not only a church, but you have a Bible college, you have schools, you have ministries, you want to get the gospel out, you, you, have, you have a vision to reach this area. And this heavy load, though, has not kept you from helping people outside this church. And um, many of you have given consistently, given generously, you've given sacrificially. And tonight on behalf of this morning, on behalf of all the missionaries, I do want to thank you for all that you've done for us. And um, I know that you've given for the right reasons because you love God and because you want to see God's work grow and you want your life to be used of God and, and you want to encourage people like me that, that serve in other places. And, and um, I'm sure you don't give so that God will bless you, but the truth is when we give to the Lord's work uh, sacrificially and consistently and generously, God has some blessings from his word that he promises for us. Now, I want to go through those at least three blessings that I found in the word of God. If you have your Bible, please turn to the book of Proverbs chapter 11. We'll start there this morning. We'll go to a few other verses as well. But I want to start at Proverbs chapter 11 and verse number 24 and 25. The first blessing, by the way, is the least important of the three blessings we'll talk about today. It is financial blessings. The Bible says in Proverbs 11:24, 24, there is that scattereth and yet increaseth. And there is that withholdeth more than is meat, but it tendeth to poverty. The liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. The Bible teaches a principle that there are those that are giving consistently, and yet the more they give to God, it seems like the more they have. And instead of their supply of money decreasing, it just continues to, to increase it. That goes against human logic and human reasoning. Because human reasoning tells us that we just can't afford to keep giving because we won't, you know, we'll go broke. But God says that you cannot outgive me. And I'm not talking about giving so you can get money. And, but when we, I'm talking about giving because you love God. And the Holy Spirit leads you to give to certain things. And when, those, when the Holy Spirit touches your heart and you do that, the Bible gives a promise. The Bible says, the liberal soul shall be made fat. I used to wonder how Brother Howes used to give so much money. And, and the, the reason he was able to give a lot of money is because he gave a lot of money. And then God gave him more money. And he gave him more money. You see, being generous really doesn't cost you any money when you're giving, being led by God's Spirit and by the Word of God. You may not have that money immediately, but, uh, but God will give it back to you because he wants you to be a channel of blessings. I remember years ago in our church, we had a man who was, who was, um, who our young people in our church found down at the Haro Plaza, which is about a quarter of a mile from our church. And this man was, did not have a home and was very, very poor. And so these young people in our church had a burden for him. They led him to Christ and they brought him to our church and people loved him. And his name was Antonio. And he, um, the young people made us a place for him to stay under a stairway of one of our buildings. Made a little place for him, it wasn't very big, but, but it was something for him. He was the poorest man in our church. You know, that's saying something. We have a lot of poor people in our church, but this man was always, he, was, he kind of complained a lot. And uh, I mean, he, he, wa he wasn't a very positive person, uh, but he, he complained. But to, that, to those young people, especially to one of those young people, I mean, they just, you know, he just couldn't do wrong. They took care of him. He had medical problems, he was older, and uh, they, they fed him, they, they clothed him, they, they did everything, any, time, any need that he had, they sacrificed and helped him. And, but to, he would always come and talk to me, he was always complaining about something. He was always saying this and that, not, not really being critical, just, and he would say, oh, you know, you know, I'm just, he came to me one day and said, Pastor, I'm, I'm gonna die, I just sure I'm gonna die, you know, so I went out on a meeting one time and, and preached, and when I came back, just a few days later, sure enough, he, the Lord took him to heaven, and so those young people, 
took him, and he didn't have any relatives, but they had a nice funeral for him. They took care of the expenses and, and everything, and, and um, they were just so good to him. And, and time passed, and one day, one of those young people got a letter in the mail, and it was from an attorney in Luzon. We live in the Visayas, the central part of the Philippines, and someone sent him a letter, and that letter was from an attorney, and the attorney wrote and said that there was that this man, this man had a valuable piece of land up near Subic Bay, where the old uh, U.S. Navy used to, to be uh, stationed, and he he had donated this piece of land to the young person in our church. So uh, you know what I did? I started going down to the plaza looking for people that didn't have a home that I could help, and. Uh, it didn't work that way, does it? You know, if you don't have the right motive. But the truth is that God will bless us financially if we give. Secondly, and this is a much bigger blessing. This is the one I want to spend most of my time on. And uh, if you can turn to Luke chapter 16, we'll read a verse that, uh, that goes along with this. The second blessing is the privilege that we have to see God's work progress, to see people get saved. Don't you enjoy giving and then seeing and hearing how God uses what you're doing through this church to, uh, to, to reach people here in this city, in this area, and even around the world. Luke chapter 16, verse 11 is a great verse about principles in, um, in giving. The Bible says there, if ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches. Now, there's two, two truths in this verse, at least two truths. One of them is that financial blessings are not true riches. They're blessings, but they're not true riches. It says right here that, that, that it's not. The second thing is that you cannot receive the true riches from God unless you're faithful in your giving. That's the test God gives you. You want real riches in your life? Let go of your money. That goal, what you have, doesn't mean you give it all away to the church. I mean, you get a, but it means that you realize you're a steward. It's God's. It's not yours anymore, and you use it for Him. And then God begins to bless. What are the true riches? Seeing people saved, Amen. seeing lives changed, seeing God use you. And you know, for the past 36 years in our in our ministry, God has used you to be so faithful to help us. And Many people have been saved because you, have, because you value uh, what's important in life, and that is people being saved. And I wish today, and I'm glad that some of you are going to come here in September, Lord willing, to visit us with, with your pastor. And, uh, but I, I wish I could take you out to O'Hare Airport and rent a couple of those 747s and maybe several of them and, and uh, fly you all the way to the Philippines and, and let you see what God has done through the investments that you made in, in, in places like ours and other places, so many missionaries that you support around the world. It's just that one little spot of the world. And, and first we'd, take a, we'd get a jeepney and uh, we'd ride on those jeepneys out to a little town not too far from the airport now called Santa Barbara, Iloilo. And we meet a man whose name is Aurelio Solas. Aurelio is, um, is a, a man that has only got one arm. And uh, he, when he was young, he lived in the island of Negros next to Panay, our island, and he was a uh, sold whiskey. That was his job. He had a whiskey truck, and he would drive up in the mountains and, and deliver the whiskey to, to different people up there and, and stores. And, and he was a very mean man, a wicked man and a mean man. He, had a, he, had, he liked to fight. His nickname was Sinki. That's Ilongo, our dialect, meaning he's hot-tempered. You say something, he just the least little thing really gets him angry. He'll fight. He had, he had scars knife from knife fights in his body, several places of his body just from fighting people. And, and one time we sent uh, like a tour group to his church, some of our college students and a staff member, and they sang and preached. And, and when, he came, when they came for some reason, he just got angry. He was going to stone the church. They had to hold him back. Just, just that kind of guy. And, but somebody had a heart for him one of our students in our Bible school, and they somehow were, were friends with him before they came to Bible school, and they really tried to get him to come to church and, and um, come to know the Lord. And so finally they got him to agree. And he said, okay, I'll come. But if anybody in that church looks at me, because he was kind of notorious, you know, I'll hit him. I don't, I don't care if it's the church. I'll. So he, he went to church. He put a bottle of whiskey in his back pocket, came to church. And he's just kind of hoping somebody would say something. Isn't that crazy? I mean, he'd get to church and walking around, and boy, those people, they were so nice. They knew who he was. But they started shaking hands. Well, we're glad you're here, really. Oh, thanks for coming. We're so honored you'd come to our church. I mean, the people were so friendly to him. 
and and it just touched his heart. Boy, he he just you know he uh, just was um, couldn't 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 be angry or anything. And and you know what happened? The the preacher preached that morning instead of being angry when he preached about needing salvation that you were a sinner and all that. He listened, and that day he got saved. And really got saved and you know he when he got saved he, God changed his life and he it wasn't long before he felt like he wanted to do something different he quit, quit, quit driving the whiskey truck immediately and then he decided God might want me to be a preacher and he didn't know how could I be one I don't have a good background but I'm he was challenged to go to Bible school and he came to our Bible school and graduated about 1987 went out and started a church in our island and, and then he later started a church in Santa Barbara he started three or four churches in his many years of service and and uh, that's true riches that is true and you had a part in that you sent me one of your uh, one of the members of this church years ago to that place to the Philippines next we go around the island we go to visit a place where Pastor Ada Lepini has been that's way up in the mountains we'd visit uh, a, a very difficult place it, it's a hard journey it's a difficult place to visit by the time you get there you think you're at the end of the world because you are I mean, it's, it's the end of it. I mean, it's, and we'd visit Billy and Cheryl Collin. Cheryl was the first convert in our church, first person I led to Christ. And uh, Billy was, was, came to Bible school in the second year of her, of her college. And, and uh, uh, we'd visit them. And it's, it, in the early 80s, it was a very dangerous place to go to because of the MPAs, the New People's Army, the Communist rebels. And Billy's father was killed up there. He was murdered by the MPA. Many people were. And, uh, so, but Billy was always trying to get me to go up there when I was a student. I mean, when, when he was a student, and I said, you know, I'm not going to go up there, Bill. It's, it's, it's too far, and it's too dangerous. But he kept after me and after me, and finally, I don't know why I did it. But uh, I, I said, okay, I'll go. Boy, he was excited. So we got up in that Jeep and went about halfway up the mountain, and then we got off. I said, you know, where's the other Jeep? He said, oh, we're going to walk. I said, how far is it? And he goes, oh, it's not very far. So we started walking. And we walked and we walked and we walked and we walked about two hours. And I said, uh, well, you know, this is kind of far. And I uh, said, well, it's, it's just over there. And, uh, you know, we walked and walked and finally we got over there where I thought was over there. And I and, uh, said, where we, how, how much further? Oh, it's just right up there. We walked and walked. Finally, we walked 18 kilometers. That's 11 miles. That's not, not flat now. It's going up the mountain, winding around everything. And, we got up this village at the top of the mountain and we looked at it, it's a village called Lacardon. And he lived in Kamandago. And I said, where's Kamandago? He says, you see down there in the valley? And you could barely see the place. That's where we're going, that's Kamandago. I said, we're gonna walk down there? He said, yeah, we're gonna walk down there. I said, you're kidding. So we walked, we started walking down that mountain and you know, it's harder to walk down a mountain. It's not, it's not harder physically, but it's, you know, you can fall easier. It's a little bit more dangerous than to go up the mountain. So we started walking. I was trying to be careful. And then I was watching for those, those rebels. I thought they might come out and shoot me or something. And, and all of a sudden, I'm walking about halfway down that mountain. And this lady, maybe she's 60, 65 years old. She's walking. She walks beside me, passes me. She's got a piece of two by four, uh, maybe 10 feet long of wood on her head. And she just passes me like it's nothing. I looked at that lady and I went, you know, and then a little while later, another lady came by. She had a huge bag of cement on her head. And she walks by like nothing happened. I said, man, I'll rent that lady and have her carry me down the mountain, you know. <laughs> I got initiative. And, uh, and she didn't do it. I finally got to the bottom of the mountain. I was tired. We had a service that night. I preached. And there were NPAs there and others. And, uh, and I preached and, and some people got saved. And, and uh, there were a few Christians there and a couple of them surrendered to go to Bible school. And I went to sleep that night in that little Nipah hut, and I was so tired. I got, I mean, I slept, and I slept really good, even though it was like a wood, bamboo, f I didn't care. I could sleep on anything. In the morning, the sun came up, and the rooster started crowing, and Billy came in and said, wake up, Pastor, we got to go. I said, why? He goes, it gets really hot going up that mountain in the morning. Let's get up. I, I couldn't move. I literally couldn't move. I said, would you help me? And I, I, mean, I was so sore, and uh, I got out of that bed, and... And we started walking up that mountain. And I'll tell you what, it's hard to walk up a mountain when you're, when you're any, any time. When you're sore, it makes it a lot different. I walked and I walked and every step up that mountain. I said, I promise God, I will never come back to this place again, Lord. I bow that to you, Lord, never again. And so finally, I was about halfway up. I was looking to, for those, those rebels to come out and shoot me, put me out of my misery. So I got to the top of the mountain and finally we got back home. I didn't talk to Billy for like a year. And uh, every time I looked at him, I, you know, I wanted to expel him or something, you know. And, and so, uh, but fine, he started working on me again. 
I said, Pastor, why don't you go back? We got a road now up there. I said, you do? I don't, that, I don't think you probably do. No, we do. So I checked this out. Other people told me, yeah, they got a, they got a road up there. I don't know how he did it. I was, you know, sometimes you don't think. I got, he got me to go up there again. And we got up there and we rode that same Jeep up there. And, and sure enough, we got about halfway up there and, and uh, there was a road, but, but the Jeep broke down. And so I didn't, I didn't walk 11 miles that day. I pushed the Jeep 11 miles that day. Oh, I finally got back. And you know what, to make a long story short, Brother Billy went up there, became our youth director for seven years, graduated in 83, youth director till, till 89, 90. Went out and started a church and just very, fairly shortly after that, started Bible school up there. And uh, all these years, for 400 years, all those people have known as Roman Catholicism and, and even communism. And, and now by God's grace, many of those guys, many, many of those guys out of Billy's Bible School, maybe 80 of them are pastoring churches there. And some of them were former NPA leaders, guys that were fighting and, and, and uh, they walk a long ways, 20, 30 miles a week just through their ministry. And, and that's true riches. And you've had a part in it for all these years. And we're so grateful for that. We take another ride up the, around the mountain, around the island. And this will be about four hours away from, from that place. And, and we go up into a mountainous area and we'd visit a man who's blind. His name is Samson Clarion. And um, when Samson Clarion was five years old, he, would, he had the measles and he lost his sight. And he had friends that influenced him to drink. And so he became, a, as a teenager, a drunkard. I mean, and, and you know, one day he thought, how foolish I must look, being blind and, and drinking. And, and he thought, you know, I wish I had something else. And, and you know what happened? He, heard, he has a radio and he listened to the radio and heard a Baptist preacher, an independent Baptist preacher, preaching about the gospel. And he got saved listening to him. He was so excited, but he didn't have a church to go to. And so he began to pray, Lord, we need, I want to go to church. And, and about a year later, one of our graduates, Ramondo Porras, came to that village to start a church. And when he started that church, he was so excited. And uh, he met Samson, another, blind, another Christian. And, and, but he, the problem was he lived about a, about a kilometer, a little over a half a mile from the church. And, you know, for a blind person to walk that far, new church is hard to do that, and no workers to do that. So, so, but he had a cow. And so the pastor and Brother Samson trained that cow. Samson would get on the cow, and they trained the cow how to walk to church. And he brought him to church every Sunday. And, uh, you know, it's amazing how I many excuses we have why we can't go to church, isn't it? But uh, every Sunday that cow took him to church. He'd go in the midweek service with the cow. And, and uh, you know, the Lord began to bless his life. He began to grow. And, and like many of our graduates, Brother Ramondo started a nighttime institute for married men. Normally they just have a few men in their church. It's very small villages they're in. And so he'll, they'll usually have two or three or four men they train to go out and start churches. And that's how, how a lot of them start more churches around their area. And so... Uh, when he started that institute, Brother Samson told the pastor, he's, of course he's blind, he said, I want, to, I, want to, I want to learn to be a pastor. And Samson kind of hesitated, well, you know, I, I don't think you could be a pastor. Blind didn't tell him that, but he, but he wanted to be a pastor, and so he let him take the classes, and sure enough, he finished, had a three-year course, and he finished, and, and then he went out and, and Pastor uh, uh, Portis and him started a church together. He pastored the church. He's been doing that for many years. And not only that, but he's trained men. He has trained a few men that have gone out and started churches himself through the years. And not only that, he's been an inspiration because there are six blind preachers on our island, five on our island, and one in Negros. Uh, four, five of them trained by our, gra by, I, by our graduates and our Bible school, and one from another pastor that trained a blind pastor. But he's been an inspiration to people that thought they couldn't pastor a church. And that's true riches, seeing someone like that serve God. And you've had a part in that. And not just that little spot in the Philippines, but all around the world where you've been investing your finances and missions for years and decades and decades and decades, God has given you true riches. Next person we'd visit is a, a, a young man whose name was Roger. He lived in uh, the other side of the island, other side of the mountains were built. He, he got saved, he got saved watching a film called The Burning Hell. How many of you heard of that film? Brother Howes is actually in that film. And he got saved. Listen to that, and he went home to his dad, and, and his dad was kind of angry. His dad was a, was a Protestant, liberal Protestant, and, and wasn't saved. And he said, I'm going to go to Bible school and be a preacher. And his dad said, if you do that, I don't want to see you again. For some reason, he just hated that. 
and was so bitter. And he said, well, God's called me to do that. I'm going to do that. And he went to our Bible school, and he thought his dad would, would kind of soften up. And, and, and so after a year of Bible school, he went home to his dad, and his dad uh, wouldn't talk to him. He said, I told you I don't want to talk to you. He finally graduated from a Bible school, and he sent an invitation to his family to come. And, and his, the father wouldn't even let his uh, sisters and brothers and wife go visit him and see him graduate. He decided to start a church in that area where his dad lived. And uh, he got there, and father still wouldn't talk to him, wouldn't let the, his wife even talk to him, just so bitter for some reason. And, and uh, so finally had, got married. Father wouldn't come to the wedding. Family couldn't come to the wedding. Had a child. Wouldn't even brought the brought the child over to the dad's house, and dad said, "I told you, don't come here." From 1985 to 1996, there's not one time when the father would allow a member of his family or himself to have a conversation with with their son. I don't know why he's so bitter, but he was. 1996 in December 1996, he was out in the rice field. The father was, and he was a he was a wicked man, notorious person. People didn't like him in the area. And somebody came and and shot him, and they took a, a, a bolo, like a machete, and, and started hitting him with that, and, and they left him kind of for dead. Well, somebody found him, and even though they didn't like him, they got him on a, a way to get to a hospital, and they got him in the hospital, and he was in really bad condition in ICU, and, and so Roger went to the hospital. Pastor Roger T. Belos went there, and, and he talked to his dad, and for the first time, his dad was glad to see him. And you know, trials soften people's hearts, and so he, he he talked talk to his dad, and, and he gave him the gospel, and he got saved. And he lived. And uh, you know, they thought he might not live, but he lived, and, and uh, he, he joined the church, got baptized, joined the church, and, and has been faithful ever since that time. As of a year ago, he, Brother Roger spoke at our graduation a year ago, and, and his daughter now is in our staff, uh, Joy. And uh, that's true riches. And that's the second blessing that we can have by giving faithfully and generously. The last uh, blessing that we, I want to speak about, if you'll turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and I want to speak about this during the service, act, the verses, so I want to go through a few verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, but let's just read verse 2 right now, if you wouldn't. The third blessing is the joy that you receive when you sacrifice. The joy that you receive when you sacrifice. All of you know what that is. When you give a lot, when you give something that, that's hard to do, that's a sacrifice, you feel good, right? The Bible says that they were living, the, the, uh, these Christians, in deep poverty. And in verse 2, the Bible says, get my, the Bible says there, how that, in a, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. Notice that phrase, the abundance of their joy. They had an abundance of joy. Why is that? Because they were giving when they couldn't give. You know, real joy comes when we give. It seems like logic tells us that we can't give. Uh, you know, I've never met a Christian. I've never met a Christian. And maybe there are some. I've never met one that sacrificed greatly and regretted it. Why? Because there's an abundance of joy. That's God's promise. If we give from the heart, God does something to our hearts. I, the other night when you had that, what's it, standing offering, something like that, man, I was touched. But I was also touched just seeing the people. Just seeing you. I mean, just seeing the love you had for, for, for us, for those of us that are missionaries. It, it was something. I, I, brought, I was thinking after that about an offering I received in the Philippines one time. They, they have different kind of offerings. They don't just give you cash. They give you other stuff. I was in a church up in um, my own copy, up in the mountains, and they had a, like a standing offering. Similar to that, I was at the front of the church. I'd preached. So people start bringing up their offerings. One of it was a bunch of bananas. They gave me that, and I was holding on to that. And then they gave me this other stuff. They gave, me, they gave me a chicken, a dead chicken. One brought a chicken that was cooked, and one brought a chicken that was alive. They gave me that. They gave me a, they bring up, kids bring me up an egg. I had like a dozen eggs. They brought me some pigeons. They brought me some lizards, two lizards. One was a small one, was a huge lizard. Man, I was getting all that stuff. And one was saying, well, those people love me, you know. And finally, the pastor said, you know, we're going to have to, when we dismiss the service, we've got a gift that, we, that our people sacrifice for. We're going to give it to you. Oh. So we went outside, and there's a sack laying on the ground, and he opened it up. And he lifted it up, poured it out. It was a python snake. He said, he said, Pastor, our people love you. <laughs> I can tell. 
he said they sacrificed. And uh, he said, you know, they gave it with joy. I didn't receive it with joy, but they gave it with joy. You know, to be honest, the snake was dead. I said, what happened to the snake? You know, it wasn't moving. I finally figured out it was dead. So what happened? Well, I tried to attack somebody this morning, but we wanted to show you. We, we worked hard to find this snake, and it was hard to catch him, and we risked our lives for you. And, and uh, I said, well, thank you. I'm glad it died, too, you know. But, you know, our, our, I used to want to send our visitors up to that place where Billy is up in the mountains. And he's moved a lot of his Bible school now into the town because just the effectiveness of the church he has in the town. But I sent people up in the mountains. I saw Brother Lapina about this morning. Sent him up there one time. But it's so poor up there. And people live day by day. The economy is much worse in the mountains and it was dangerous. And so I always wanted to send people, I wanted people just to see that and feel the joy that I had when I would go and visit that area and, uh, and experience the hardness of it too. And so I was trying to look for someone to be my guinea pig, and I knew, you know, I was trying to think of somebody. I didn't want to send a pastor up there. He, you know, he might get shot and die or something. Some church would be mad. So I thought maybe assistant pastor would work, you know? That wouldn't be so bad, right? So, uh, or some other full time. So I finally found someone and uh, sent him up there, and, and I wonder, what is he going to think when he comes back? What's he, I'm not going up there with him. I'll let him sit up there and kind of be, you know, calm down a little bit. So he comes back, and he could hardly talk and walk. And uh, he was too tired to get upset and, and uh, found out he didn't get shot. And, and uh, he was too tired to say anything about what happened. And, but he told me, he said, you know, uh, told me later, he said, uh, after he went back to the station, he said, you know, they left, that, that, but Billy left his, um, gave some letters uh, to me from his students. And he said, I took those letters, this is the man that went up there, he said, I took those letters and, and uh, took them home with me. And, and, you know, it's not unusual uh, for when a visitor comes over, sometimes people will, Christians will write and ask them for something. I teach our people never do that. Never ask never a visitor for something. And so this guy had been there many times to the Philippines, several times. And he, uh, he thought, you know, they're going to ask for something, a Bible or something that they need. And, and uh, so he, he put those letters aside. And then when he flew back to the States, he was on the airplane, had a long flight over. So he had time. So he got those letters out, thought he'd read them. And he opened up those letters, began to read them. And, and uh, they... Uh, they were very broken English uh, because they're up in the mountains and they would say thank you for being a blessing to us and you know you're so good thank you for coming and inside that first letter was a was some money paper money folded up 50 paces maybe and, and he took that letter and boy he was touched and the next letter and the next letter and the next letter and the next letter and all those students writing him every single one of those letters had some little some money in it and uh, He'd been there some, but he probably didn't realize, but, but for those kids, that meant some of them wouldn't have their needs for several days. And you say, well, that, that's a hardship for people like that. Why would they do something like that? Because there is great joy in being a blessing to other people. And you know what I thank God for being able to be in the Philippines because, because they've been able to experience people that have given sacrificially. And you know, God is so good. He's so good to give us blessings. There's three things that God will bless us with according to the word of God, if we do serve and we, we give consistently. He'll bless us financially. He will show us true riches in seeing people saved. Seeing our investment do something. We, give invest, we invest in something financially and something, in land or building or something. We want to get some money back. God gives us some true rewards, true blessings. And then thirdly, he gives us great joy. Let's bow our heads and pray, and then I'll ask maybe Brother Wilkerson to lead us. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this lesson from your word that lord the, the principles of your word about giving thank you lord for these dear people that have been so good to me for 36 years and so good to so many people around the world for so many years help them to see the riches of the true riches that they've had because of their gifts and we pray this in christ's name amen